hello and welcome back everybody to Chatting Breeze. This week we have an incredibly special episode for you, one that has been a long time coming. Um, my good pal and incredibly all-round splendid fellow and absolute bad boy producer selector extraordinaire Fraser Ray jumps into the Chatting Breeze studio for an hour of mishaps when he came down to Bristol the other week. Um, for his show, I think, at The Crown for Touching Shoulders, which was a mental booking, by the way, by those guys, so big up for that. Um, anyway, yeah, really, really, really good episode. If you know Fraser, if you've ever spoken to him, he's just such a lovely guy. Ch- tattered about everything from what it was like coming up during the Breakbeat revival, um, chatted about music media for a little bit. I asked him for a bit of advice, um, chatted about trousers, um, chatted about online trolls. Uh, I won't spoil anything else for you because it's a damn good episode. I'll let, let you get straight into it. So yeah, um, make sure to give this a five star on Spotify, like on YouTube, like on SoundCloud, blah, 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 patreon.com slash belters. Oh, actually, that's the thing. We've just put our forthcoming compilation up on the Patreon for our members, and we haven't even bloody announced it yet on here. So if you want to go give that a listen and download all the tracks completely for free, well, obviously you have to pay to sign up to Patreon, but it's a damn good deal, then head over to patreon.com slash belters right now and do that. Okay, now I'm actually going to leave you to it. Bye. And we're in. Well, hey. We're here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we fucking made it after <laughs> the trains tried to cancel us, bro. The trains tried to stop us from, from, from happening. You can't keep a good man down. That's, exactly. what they, that's what they say, isn't it? Which one of us is the good man? Uh, oh, yeah, P- nice. yeah, 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 yeah. Let's not go there. Let's yeah, not go yeah, there. Yeah. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Chatting Breeze. Today I'm here with a very special guest. You already know if you're watching the video version or if you've seen the title, you definitely already know. Uh, we have Fraser Ray in the studio. Fraser, how the devil are you, sir? I'm all right, yeah. Pretty good. Pretty like pretty tired. Was in XLR with main phase last night. Of course, I saw videos um, of that. Yeah, it was good. It was proper, proper good. It looked so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that club. Absolutely love it to pieces. Yeah, shout out to Chris, uh, the owner of XLR, for putting the residency together. I've never He's actually been. I've, I've, I've never touched XLR before. I saw um, main phase repping the white be- the white vest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He pulled that out of nowhere. Yeah, He's, he had a full <laughs> wife beater on. Like, uh, yeah, he just pulled it out. And some guy from the crowd gave us both stickers. I saw that saying as well. like, "I love main phase and I love Fraser Ray." That was dedication. I was trying for ages, like, get it off the thing. I had to give it back to him in the crowd to actually take it off. My fingers <laughs> just weren't working. Obviously, it's the excitement of seeing it. You're yeah. a DJ, not a sticker yeah. user. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. How did you? Yeah, how did you wind up with that? that residency yeah so i played played at xlr for chris a few times um and then he chatted about wanting to i think like manchester is in like a is it is an interesting state where if you're a big dj and you get booked to play warehouse project they usually have really uh, long exclusivity clauses i've so, heard about these yeah yeah so you can't play in manchester for like quite a few months either side so basically um chris wanted to get some bigger artists in at XLR, but then, um, and then kind of chatted to me and um, talked to me about maybe uh, using kind of my network to put together like, God, that sound is so cringy. Ah, my, using my, my extensive mm. network. Yeah, he, he just basically <laughs> chatted to me and just basically to to see where, you know, if I can have conversations with people to maybe get around there or if I knew certain people who weren't playing Warehouse Project who might have kind of, um, you know, the time to do that, yeah. basically, if that makes sense. Sorry, I'm just chatting rubbish, man. Mate, the, God. The, the, mate no, the podcast is called Chatting Breeze. Okay, yeah, exactly, well, this exactly is perfect. Right thing. Thing. I, know, I feel like we're in a setting where I'm about to be like, yeah, I wake up at, at, at 4 a.m. and then I do like my um, my, 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 my spirit bonding yeah. with my partner for an hour and then I'll do seven hours in the gym and then drop my kids off at school and then I'll go back to sleep at six in the evening. Yeah, Is that actually your routine, is that? Uh, no, because I'm not an animal. I'm not an animal. Yeah, they all look the same. I think the the men who do that, they're all like very roidy, aren't they? In bold. Yes. Um, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. I like to think that this isn't one of those podcasts, but I mean, we're only in episode 14, so yeah. I mean, say. I mean, we could get on steroids at some point. Me Maybe that could be. Yeah, chatting breeze could just steadily become like <laughs> chatting roids. Yeah. <laughs> you start, and I'm just like injecting something into my ass <laughs> yeah. or whatever. So what do you think of this steroid? <laughs> oh yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Um, I had a little scroll on your Instagram this morning just. To to do a okay. bit of research and I got to the bottom and I didn't realise how long you've been like c- cutting about for oh, I've been about yeah you man been I've about. been about yeah because obviously I, I knew of you before when you had your previous alias mm-hmm. 
through that. But even then, like I went to the bottom of your Instagram, your first post that is public is from like 2019, mm-hmm. I think. And even then you already had like a rinse show or you were mm-hmm. playing on rinse yeah, yeah, and that yeah. sort of yeah. thing. When did you actually get into the scene? When were you starting uh, to put stuff out? It's a good question. I think like I started, I mean, dude, it was like, 10 years ago maybe Fuck. that I made my first Sandboy Killer track mm. but it was like it was a complete one off um, it was like I, I didn't really know how to produce well at that point and I just happened to kind of make a track which like sounded alright mm. um, and then that did well on like Only Vibes like this YouTube like channel thing when there wasn't that many like ch- uh, channels for, for the kind of underground music about mm. Anyway, I did well on then, but then like, mate, it took me like th- another three years maybe till I could actually start to write or write club music. I oh, kind yeah. of think I just got a bit lucky with what I did the first time. Right. And then was like trying to trying to make more music and just struggling massively. Um, so anyway, yeah, then that must have been, that must have been about 2018 because it was in my final year of Leeds. Okay. Um, and then it just started to kind of come together then. But like, I think it was when I did like Burning in maybe mm-hmm. 2019. That's kind of when I like, Felt like I was doing a bit more kind of yeah. musically. And what label was that on? Because obviously I remember the artwork, but I couldn't tell. Yeah, you the that label. was on O'Flynn's label. Yeah. So yeah, he chatted to me. It was very nearly on Big Scoop. It was very nearly on Lobster Theremin run oh, really? by Asquith. So oh my I'm goodness. very glad that that Th- didn't happen. This is the second time that this is <laughs> the the Lobs, Lobs has been brought up. We had No Nation on like, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, and he said that he had the same thing where he had an album signed to them, mm-hmm. and then he, like basically they wouldn't sort of give him the tracks back so he just released the whole thing as like a redacted mm, project and just mm. everything like untitled whatever and it's like but they don't really have a leg to stand on at that point what are they going to chase after you, do yeah, you know what I mean? like, yeah 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 I, I suppose like if, they've, if there's no money like like changed hands either way yeah, like what uh-huh. do you actually owe the label anyway yes, in the first place like exactly. yeah, it's bizarre but um but yeah no i remember i was at the pub with o'flynn um, and we just started hanging out and like, yeah, just mentioned the tracks to him. Um, I think he'd already been playing Burning as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like, he just really wanted to put them out. And I think he, yeah, it was on his 100 Flowers label. He doesn't really do anything much on it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, man, it was it was, it was really cool. It was, it, that was, yeah, definitely a big thing which sort of changed it. But yeah, dude, I've been about it for time. I was hanging out with, um, who were they called? I was hanging out with... Skeptic and like oh, yeah. um, and Silver Bumper the other day, mm-hmm. who are both really young. They're like twenty one and twenty two. Yeah, they look like twelve year olds. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. But like <laughs> they, they've obviously that. Yeah, they, they they look very young, you know. And I think that's. Uh, but I think that's good. They've got a youthful. Oh no, energy yeah, no, it's not. It's them. not yeah, a bad yeah, thing yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, but uh, they, yeah, they, they've, they've like obviously, I suppose they are straight out of uni. Skeptic's still studying. They, mm. they're like properly in it. But like, I think it all started kind of really kicking off for me when I was like 26, 27. Mm, mm. So I think like, I, I definitely really appreciate everything that's happened because mm. I've just had like, like basically I suppose like a good seven years of trying to do music and nothing really happening. So then kind of everything that does happen feels like a real blessing. I, I think. think it's interesting, isn't it? Because like in like real, like the grand scheme of things, it's not that long ago, right? But I feel like the trajectory that, people expect to experience now when they're like releasing mm. music is potentially a lot uh it's a lot of a shorter timeline than what it was maybe when you were, were mm. first doing it like you say you had like seven years of doing it and nothing happening you know right, when you look at some of the, the these names you know like like these younger faces that are coming through they've maybe only been producing for you know two or three years and they're already like you know selling out these like medium to large size venues like why do you think that is? Do you think that's because of like the increase in popularity i guess of, of, of the dance music space or yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think it's like, it's been happening for a little while. I remember like Maul Grab mm. really, like he broke through when mm. he was really young. Like he, he had a, like a massive like rise, a trajectory mm. upwards. What's the word I'm looking for? It's good. We're chatting breeze. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I think maybe like back in the day, labels, like the, the infrastructure around labels was mm. different. Um, and I think like before the internet, it's probably very hard to get your music out there unless it was signed to a label. And like, I don't know, you meet a lot of like the older heads Mm -hmm. uh, or you hear a lot of stories about the older heads and like they're very different than a lot of DJs and producers now. There's a lot of like um, closing off of things. They're not very welcoming to people. You hear a lot of stories about, you know, the older DJs and producers just not playing, playing not being very nice. I think it's really rare to like meet new DJs or producers who are like young, who are coming up, who are like, I think everyone in the scene is lovely, which is really, really nice. 100%. um, So maybe that's it. Like, Back in the day, things used to be more closed off 
Um, and that would therefore stop people rising up. But now with stuff like the internet, you you know, you can you can have a, tr- a track out on Bandcamp, you know, the day you make it. Mm-hmm. And anyone in the world can buy that. And maybe it's just stopped that... Um, Maybe that, yeah, I don't know, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm ranting. No, it's, I'm not it's <laughs> completely fine, honestly. I, I think it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because you mentioned like maybe like the the older heads or you know whatever you want to call it. Like um, maybe there was a thing then of like back then you feel like you had almost more to lose, whereas now it mm. feels like there's more like a democratization mm. of everything. So like you, you don't feel like that someone else who's coming up could like steal your spot maybe in the same way that it would have been like back, back, back when it was originally being done mm. um i think the scenes were a lot smaller back in the day as well i think mm. with like the hardcore scene and then in the like the 90s there was supposedly there was only like five or six djs who actually toured around the uk mm-hmm. um there was loads there was lots of producers but they the actual people playing the gigs and making like the, the big money and stuff there was only a few of them mm-hmm. um there was like did you hear about the oh the, what were they called it was like the garage mafia or the garage secret circle or something like that oh the guys they had like meetings that were talking yeah. about this like new wave that was coming through yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it was <laughs> speed garage they basically when speed garage started coming through they were like they met up in a pub and they were like we need to not play speed garage pur- purposely because it's going to change the sound it's going to stop people like coming to the club it's going to change the vibe and the energy and obviously That's it didn't so, work so crazy yeah it's mad to think you still sort of have purists I guess to that extent but it does seem like the people that were doing it originally now have much stronger connections like keeping it how it was you know whereas I think now a lot of producers are like sort of pushing things forward and quite unapologetically and that Mm. is the stuff that is resonating with a lot of people as well Mm. I think you know as like um, as like audiences change, like, you know, there's the whole thing of like during COVID that there was like that gap. And then the people that then started raving after COVID are like, com- they, you know, the, the, almost the crowds in clubs are completely switched over to this like completely new audience that was like on social media and all that sort of thing. It completely changed the way that people sort of enjoy rave music, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, going back a little bit, you were in Leeds, yeah? Yeah, I was in Leeds, for, for yeah. How, were you studying I was there? there for like six years, yeah. I went up, okay. went up there to study and then started teaching. Uh, yeah, teaching is something I wanted to get into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, what it, w- w- when you initially? So, what were you studying? I guess first of all, when you so were I at did university? music production. Okay. Um, Classic. Yeah, I screwed my A levels up. Like, really? Yeah, really, really badly. Like, like just I suppose just didn't put enough effort into them. Mm. Um, I think like yeah, really, really, really screwed them up. Um, and then luckily managed to get into Leeds College of Music or Leeds. Leeds Conservatoire. Oh yes, now that's the, yes. Um, but like just, just basically back on the back of like my portfolio of music that I made. Mm. But like if I wasn't making, yeah, if I wasn't making music, I don't know what I'd be doing now. What were you Probably, doing? Did you do A level? Sorry, I did music. Mm. Um, which even that I did terribly. And really? I've got, I've got big issues with like I don't want. We won't get deep into it now, but I yeah. think the whole way music is like structured and taught and the syllabus and stuff in schools is completely wrong interesting um, yeah it's 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 w- w- maybe we will go into it it's like way too classically focused uh-huh. um it's way too academic you can have like a brilliant and i've had this personally like be, like in my teaching experience yeah. like you have like a brilliant musician who's like been playing drums in like a church like like from the age of three mm. they'll be like one of the best drummers you've ever met in your life and they'll get a you because they can't do the academic side. They can't like reference like an obscure aspect of Baroque music that was only popular for like 50 years. And they can't explain the inner workings of that. Like, and therefore they, they don't get the marks. Like it's, it's really outdated. It's, so it's really, outdated. yeah. I find that it's, it's, like, it's like that with like a lot of creative subjects in terms of how you teach it and how you grade it is so sort of like up in the air mm. and very vague. Like, like you say, you shouldn't have to have this knowledge of that. Like if you're, if you're doing, if you're incredibly talented, like, like instantly, like you say, like these people that have been playing since God mm-hmm. knows how long, like you shouldn't, yeah, it just seems crazy. Do you find that obviously when, when you're teaching, um, you do have to adhere to like curriculum and, and that sort yeah. of thing. Do you feel like there is any sort of leeway for you to help those sort of students out to, to ensure that they I mean, we don't have to rely so much on that like that academic side of things or no, actually it's a big part of the yeah. course yeah i'm more talking about like i suppose yeah i'm talking more about like the gcses and the a levels but right. it's like you know it's like 40 percent of your entire grade is just one like listening paper that you do at the very end um yeah man it's hot it's, it's horrible Mental. like it's horrible to see kids that love music fail mm. at their subject because they can't do that but yeah anyway it's mm. you know it's a, it's a conversation that's like 
you could go on for hours for sure, and hours yeah. and hours. So, but, so you graduated from Leeds, yeah. And then what you started teaching straight away? Yeah, I went straight into teacher training. Okay. Um, yeah, because I mean, like, yeah, I, I think like I knew I wanted to do something. I, I got like really inspired to teach by my um, in uni. I had like a really good seminar like leader who was just really inspiring really fun, really personable. And I was like, that looks, that looks really fun. That mm. looks really rewarding what he's doing. So yeah, I did that. Went straight into teacher training. And that's when I like, I think I was like living on my own at the time. And I, all I do is I was working so hard those year, that year doing it. But mm. like my one release was just making music. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, just sit there and just like, I think I was spending like maybe like three hours a day, maybe writing tunes every evening for like a good few hours. Oh my goodness. Um, and then when I started teaching in school, I, was, I just kept that up. And then like, yeah, I just had this like three year um, period where I was just like, yeah, writing stupid amounts of tunes. Was there ever like a period where you thought that the two were sort of at odds with each other and where you're thinking, right, shit, I might, I might have to choose one mm. or the other at some point? No, I think it's like, I've always been able to balance it. Mm. Um, I did, I did, I went full time music last year and found myself like, the least creative I've ever been. Um, I think I was like putting way too much, because I was kind of like, right, this has got to be my money making career now. And I think like when I was starting to like worry about, I was talking to you earlier about like not having a gig in January and I was like, how am I going to pay my rent? Like mm -hmm. if I'm not getting any money from gigs. Um, so I think like I was making really bad decisions musically. I went through like a little Fred again month or two oh, like yeah. last year where I was like, cool, I'm going to make like Fred again star music. Oh, yeah. And like made probably some of the cringiest music I've ever made in my life that I can't listen to anymore. Cause I'm like, oh. Did any of it see a release at nope. all? Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> no, no, no it that is, yeah, that is going to, yeah, that is locked away. <laughs> That's going to die yeah. with you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't bring myself to delete it, but you know, but Maybe, maybe in 10 years, I'll be able to listen to it mm. without just cringing. You can release it in 10 years and then it'll be cool because it'll be like, like old school. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there we go. And I'll be like, yeah, man, <laughs> all the heads. When you're, yeah. yeah. Back in my day, we have real music. We have exactly. Fred again. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's interesting you bring up like the, the full-time music and like the sort of conundrum that can bring mm. up because I have friends that have, that have gone full-time music and, and like gone really well for them. But then I also had like vice versa, like with yourself, like it's tough isn't it because it, for, for most people it would seem like the dream wouldn't it it would seem like oh you know you're so lucky you get to do this, this all the time like do you, do you feel like if you were because obviously I think you, you've gone back into teaching now mm -hmm. right yeah. Yeah, yeah if you were to continue doing doing just full time music is there no way you could sort of just completely stick to your like creative like true self you would have to deviate or uh, I'm, dude I make like I think the music I make is I think what I do best in the music I make is make underground dance music, like pretty aggressive, mm -hmm. pretty banging. And I think like you see it with like a lot of, a lot of producers who like rise up, like Sammy Vergy at the moment, like mm. he, he's a wicked producer, wicked DJ, mm. all around legend. Um, he's just done his like latest release is, is wicked. It's a wicked track, mm. but it's like a melodic vocal track. Yeah. And it's like signed to EMI. Um, you can tell it's like, it's got a, like a proper marketing campaign behind it. You know, I, I've no doubt it's like a team of people mm -hmm, working of with Sammy doing that. And, um, but I think it just shows like, it's at some point it sounds like there's been a conversation where they've been like, I, we, we maybe, why don't you try doing like a melodic thing? Because like, I think you can't, I couldn't imagine Hackney Pigeon being played in like daytime radio one, yeah. but <laughs> I can't imagine Fred again doing it. So I think like, I think there is like to a certain extent when you get to like that level that like Sammy Virgie is the next step you do, I think you do have to go more melodic and that can be really horrible. And that can like, that's, oh, he's obviously done that really well because mm. the, the, his new track slaps, but mm. I struggled with that massively. That's something I was going to mention was that like you've been around for like for a while and like, you, and, like I'm you've, old, yeah. You're old as fuck, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and like obviously you've you've done really well and like you're such a recognised name within like the underground space and like you've, you know, you've played all these festivals, you've had such like big like gigs. Oh, bloody hell. Know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So like somehow like as far as I'm, as far as I can see it, maybe this is just how you portray yourself, but you like you, you have completely kept it very independent and, and, and mm -hmm. very underground throughout. Mm -hmm. Like have you had much interaction or even like have any of these sort of like big corporate overlords ever tried to like reach out to you? Yeah, I've had chats with management people who mm -hmm. look and take me on, but like I don't think yeah, I don't think it's for me. Mm -hmm. I think like I I, th I don't think I I think like I really appreciate always having the final say in stuff. I definitely think I could do with a bit of organization, but mm. I think like I, 
I think I really enjoy being, having autonomy kind of on everything that I do. Everything feels like it's my decision. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever like, and then if something doesn't go right, I've, I can just put that on myself. I don't ever have to like feel annoyed at someone else maybe for completely. like suggesting something wrong, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. No, I completely, I completely feel the same way. Obviously like I'm nowhere near the same sort of like position in my like timeline as you are. Mm. But I think it's that element of like knowing that if it goes well, then you can thank yourself. But if it goes wrong, then you know, you only have yourself mm -hmm. to blame sort yeah. of thing. Um, but you've managed to obviously like you have an agent for bookings and things. Yeah. Like, oh, oh yeah. 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 To be fair. Yeah. The, the one person I suppose I work with on a regular is my lovely agent, Carl, who's mm -hmm. just the sweetest. I've heard nothing German but man. good things about Carl actually. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 He's really well regarded in the scene. How um, long have you been with him for? I've been with him since Burning came out. Oh, so really? that must be like four years, maybe. No, it's 2024, isn't it now? Yeah. Bloody hell. So yeah, almost five Something years. Like that. Jeez. Yeah, he I was the one of the first people he took on when he started the agency. Oh really? Um, so it's him and a lovely woman called Joe. Um yeah, and they started it together. But when when they started the so so I played at Om 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 Um Om in Berlin. Sure. Um, yeah. it's, uh, I played there and uh Played there for Jamie from Sneaker Social Club. Mm. Um, and just like at the very start of the night, he like told me two things and he was like, oh yeah, just just to um, just to give you a quick heads up. Um, I'm going to record your set tonight. Is that all right? And this was like one of my first gigs I'd done. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> luckily I'd like, pra <laughs> luckily I practiced it for like five times, nice. like before, um, mm. like before doing it. And then he was like, also, um, my mate Carl and uh, my partner Joe are um, uh, looking to start an agency and they think about taking you on as a client. But, uh, so so yeah, have a good set. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So I just walked straight to the toilet and just threw up. Um, and then I was like, okay, all right, this is fine. Walk back, I was like shaking. And yeah. then it's just like, I'm, okay, I'm just gonna go one more time. Went back to it, threw up again. And then went back to the decks, was about to start. And I was so nervous. And I was like, I'm gonna throw up again. And I was like, I'm literally on. Like Jamie was like mixing the final track. I was like, oh my God, what do I do? And like went to this dark corner, was just about to throw up the realizer pile of coats there moved all the coats out of the way and just went again and then that was it that was the final one and then just started playing and it was alright after that oh but you can God. listen to that set on SoundCloud if you check it out <laughs> that exact set and it's it's one of my favourite sets I've ever done so unbelievable yeah. but dude I used to do that before every set I, what throw I, up? yeah I used to throw up before every single set with nerves like really? at, the, at the very very start yeah like I suppose 2019 mm -hmm. um yeah, 2018, 2019 time. My goodness, um, and that just sort of went away with time, I guess. Just went away with time, yeah, yeah. My God. Yeah, I, I, was bad. I was a nervous little boy back then. Wow, how long did it sort of take you, you reckon, to sort of get over that? I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, actually. I, I, I'm thinking whether I still used to get nervous before, like, if definitely after COVID, mm. I definitely, like, you, you know, I've, I think I've, I've done it enough now where I don't seem to get nervous anymore. Yeah. But, like, bef I'm wondering whether it was before COVID or whether it was, like, a moment where it just all was fine. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, it used to be, used to be, um, that's difficult. crazy. <laughs> you reminded me of, of sneaker social club. Actually, I kind oh, of yeah. hadn't forgotten about them, but they were sort of one of the names where when I first got into everything, they were like quite like a big, like reputable name. And I'm sure they, they're they still putting releases out now. Yeah. So, uh, shout out to Jamie as well. So he, Jamie was like, like Jamie runs sneaker social club. He's an absolute legend. Mm. Um, he was like really useful in helping kind of like develop, me as an artist like mm. he gave me like some of my first ever like feedback on tunes and stuff like that like really helped me like grow it was like giving me stuff to listen to so yeah I love that man um, but yeah he is definitely I think Sneak Social Club's like is a really interesting label because it's always kind of like feels like it's at the forefront of like mm -hmm. new musical sounds and in like 2018 19 that was like the kind of breaks I was revival say, sort yeah, of stuff yeah. and now it's like it's I don't even know how you describe it now. He's he's doing like quite a lot of like 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 grime and drill, but like instrumental sort of stuff. Right. So there's some really exciting stuff like coming out. Mm. It's um yeah, I I don't know many of the artists that are like that are on, on there as well. So he's clearly mm. got like a really good ear for like like scouting things out. He's just running a night actually with Henzo and someone else who's really, really sick as well. And I was like, that is so Sneaker Social Club, mm. that sort of vibe. Um, How long were they going before, before you sort of teamed up with them for a absolutely bit? Absolutely no idea. No <laughs> idea at all. <laughs> um, the, 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 the Breaks revival stuff mm. was super interesting because that was sort of just starting to peter off as I was coming into things. Because I, I 
started Belters in like 2021, I think it was. Yeah. And that was like, it was still very much there. And I, I was definitely playing a lot of breaks, but I think it was more morphing into this sort of like new garage revival mm -hmm. that, that we're seeing now. Um, you're one of the only guys who I know at the level that you are that's still sort of championing that and pushing mm -hmm. that forward. Yeah. And that's something that I really respect. Is breakbeat, I think, to you, is it something that you always see as being like a, a uh, constant in, in your music and in your sound. Yeah, I think so. It feels true to myself. I mm. think like I've been really messing with the way I like use breaks. I think like I, when I started making music, you know, it's like really 90s hardcore revival, mm -hmm. but also really like kind of pastiche. Um, and I think like it was getting to the point where I was basically just remaking tunes that already existed in the 90s. So then I was kind of like, how do you how do you push that forward? Mm. Um, so I, yeah, I, mean, I suppose maybe like a year or two ago, I was doing a lot of like garage but, but breaks and that was so difficult because of like swing and if you're like trying to like warp a sample to put like a drum break to yeah. put the swing in it sounds awful so like <laughs> there was there was I had so many headaches doing that but now I'm like kind of I don't know I don't really know what I'm kind of doing at the moment I think like doing like groovy sort of breaks I mm -hmm. suppose is maybe what I'd say at the moment I, I obviously do like offshoots I've got, I've got some like speed garage tracks I'm sat on at the moment but like quite melodic mm -hmm. sort of speed garage and like um a bit more kind of hardcore-y ravey stuff but mm -hmm. like yeah I think my home that I always keep going back to is breaks no idea why that is but mm -hmm. like but it's, it's I think like it mate it was Hackney Parrot started it off I remember when I heard Hackney Parrot that was like a, like a awakening inside me yeah. I was like what the hell is that and I think that maybe just like peaked peaked my interest in the right point that it's kind of stuck mm. stuck since then do you find then that like the way like you say even you made a few speed guys tracks mm. you know uh like you said you even you know it's maybe a bit more melodic or whatever do you find that the way i mean of course like as the scene moves and goes in different directions how much of an influence do you think that actually has on on, on your sound or would you say it's more just you developing as like a like as an island i suppose mm. Uh, maybe that's too. Maybe that's yeah, a difficult question. That's that's a really tricky question. I think like, like, do you sort of consume and feel like you're taking inspiration fr from from others, or or do mm. you find inspiration from like things outside of the dance music space? I think I I take a lot of influence from old music. Still, I think like the majority of all dance music I listen to is is from the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, all the records I buy are from the nineties. So like. I suppose like musically, I get a lot of influence from that, but I feel like you can't be at an island because I, I feel like if it's it's all well and great making like some wacky stuff that like like is completely different, but like at the end of the day, you, you know, one of the only real ways to make money from music anymore is from performing and touring. Mm -hmm. And I think like if I, started making some weird fluty jazz mm -hmm. that might be amazing and that'd be my like be completely great but like that would just completely stop any sort of like touring event that i have so like i think i do pay attention to a lot of kind of modern music going on um like knowing that you know garage is big at the moment mm -hmm. obviously like then i've always loved speed garage but obviously i was like let's let's give some speed garage crack because mm -hmm. it feels like this is maybe the moment in time this will be most appreciated yeah. rather than if i decide to make it in five years mm -hmm. um and then kind of have it be slept on because it's already happened or because it's not kind of happened yet, if that makes sense. Would you like to make fluty jazz? <sighs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some like Bulgarian folk nice. music or something in there as well. Do you reckon Do you got it in you? I think I could. I actually think I could. I give it a crack. Dude, I used to make ambient music. Really? That was, I genuinely thought that was going to be my musical path that I went down. Really? It was like, I love Steve Reich, uh, if, if you know him at mm -hmm. all. Um, or like, and um, and like people like Philip Glass and like really loved ambient music as well. And then was... Um, was kind of like why don't I just meld the two and do like this the like so I basically I was making like electronic minimalism music and I was like this is it this is what I'm gonna this is what, but like I yeah I don't know how if there was a market for that at all you can still find that online somewhere really? but yeah I'll, I'll send you a private link but anyone I, else I'm gonna keep that a little bit of a secret I from. presume your electronic minimalism ambient wasn't under the name Sandboy Killer it, no it wasn't <laughs> would have been a nice juxtaposition though it wouldn't it yeah. yeah 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 um you you mentioned your like your sets and you know the fact that performing is probably one of the best best ways to like i guess earn money as as, mm. as, as a, a producer or whatever mm. um what, what are your sets like nowadays and how have they changed over time 
Oh wow! Um, like, can you think back to your, your your first set, the one, the sneaker social yeah, one? Yeah, Obviously, that's up online. What can you remember? What kind of stuff you you were playing in that? Yeah, well, I've always mixed my sets up massively. I get yeah. really bored just playing one one type of music. I think because I also like DJs who play loads of different stuff. Like Joy mm. Orbison's one of my favorite DJs. He's not like the cleanest mixer. Like you listen to a Ben UFO set, and it's like just like it's like beautifully um, kind of arranged. You yeah. can't even hear his transitions. Whereas I love Joy sets because they are rough transitions mm -hmm. he, he will like it's sometimes the track won't work together that well but there's something exciting about that and i think like that's something i try and do is just like t take risks play lots of kind of different genres across that's definitely something i keep doing but like maybe one thing which has changed is i definitely pay a lot more attention to the mix stands of tracks that I play now because mm -hmm. I've just had too many bad experiences playing like a Drexia track and it just sounding like crap on a system and like people just kind of like literally stopping dancing because it just the whole sounds just sort of because it just there. sounds so bad even though it's like it could be the wickedest track ever but if it, it I, I think I do my gravitate towards stuff that I know is going to translate really well on the system nowadays mm, that's interesting I guess it's like you would think that, I guess it's just a matter of if a producer doesn't get a, their mix down right on, on, on their end. Like, what, are there any, like, is there anything you can do if you really like a track, but like the mix down is fucking crud? Is there anything you can do your end to sort of like, make it know. playable? Yeah, maybe like a bit of EQing. I like, I made a, I, I keep right, I keep going viral for like, for oh, like yeah. saying random things. And like, I did this nudes talk. <laughs> I was, yeah, no, I was oh my God. So I'm going to be very careful with what I say here because I don't want this to be like, yeah, don't want this yeah. to people what be like, What was it you oh. said on that one where people got annoyed at you? Oh God, I said that... Right, and yeah, this will be my moment to clarify it. Yes, here we um, go. So I said <laughs> that basically you can hear the difference in music in a, like across different DAWs. Like, and I've spoken to so many producers about this recently and they all agree. You can literally spot like a track made in FL Studio from a mile away. You can really hear when something's been made in Logic. You can mm -hmm. really hear when something's been made in Ableton. And then like people like, people in the comments are like saying, oh no, but if you, if you put an audio file in there and then export it in both DAWs, it's going to sound the exact same. And yeah, obviously it will, but it's like, when you're making music in FL Studio, you've got all these different native plugins, which will sound different. Like the 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 EQ in FL Studio is going to sound completely different. The Logic's native one. Sure. Um, and also like FL's got like a clipper on the master, which is going to change the sound as well. But also like the way the music's like actually written as well. Like if, if music's got tons of automation going on, it's usually done in Ableton because it's so easy to automate stuff mm -hmm. in there. If the music is super, super rhythmic, um, sounding then it's probably done in fl because it's set up you like when you i don't know how familiar you are with, not with like, fl really but, but it's got like basically like a, a step sequencer when you go in right, so like okay. instantly you're going to be making something percussive in there straight away mm -hmm. um it's yeah i think like but yeah anyway so people in the comments were just going really? for my soul yeah like this <laughs> absolutely going for me the best comment was like i don't i don't rec uh, recommend anyone to watch this master class um <laughs> mate it's so good if, yeah, if you want a good laugh have a look through those comments <laughs> they, oh my god um but yeah so i suppose to go back to that then to clean up like a good dude actually sorry and another thing from that nudes thing which here got, we go which got he's, like, he's, he's like, ticked yeah, off now yeah here we go the, the gate's open the, ga the gate's <laughs> opening now the floodgates are open now it's a podcast so mate. the other thing I said was mm. that I, I was basically bigging up this sample pack that like really helped me starting to make oh music. the jungle the jungle one. jungle yeah, one yeah. and then loads of people in the comments were like huh there's no real m m um, musicians anymore they're just using samples oh, or because like you that. didn't use like an Omega or whatever yeah, to, like, good, yeah, they, like uh, yeah they record or their hand claps live or something <laughs> like that I don't, I don't know man it's ridiculous people I think people just like to complain I think that's um, but like it did make me realise I was like god why are all the comments in this so horrible and then I look and then on Instagram as I'm just looking at any reel now I'll just look at the comments and all the comments on any reel yeah. are horrible it's so rare that you actually see a reel where everyone's being positive 100%. on there I, I can literally there's like one guy who I, who I can only see positive comments on and he's this guy called like Mutton or something and he just goes around pubs um, drinking like filming himself just drinking drinking Guinness and everyone loves him. That's fine. <laughs> 
get, but why don't people love me? Mate, we're in the wrong business, yeah. I think. We got to start filming ourselves drinking. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, how was that the uh, masterclass thing you did? Because you, yeah, you really did it with good. Abby, right? Yeah, I did it with Abby. Yeah, yeah. Abby was um, kind of comparing and hosting. Um, mm. Dude, I was so ill when I, really? when I got it. I was like, it, like I was just coming down with the flu. Oh, shit. Um, and then ended up being in bed like the two days afterwards. Oh, my but, like, God. I, I could fully feel it, but I was like, I just need to commit. I'm just going to get through it and do it. But um, yeah, she's wicked. Love Abby. Um, yeah, shout out to the to the nudes team as well. They mm, um, mm. yeah, they ran a tight ship there. Um, mm. It was really nice, like in a in like an old cinema. Um, yeah, the Cube, I think it was. Yeah, the Cube. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've got like Ploy and Denim Audio and someone else who I wasn't that familiar with um, doing the next one. So nice. they should be really cool as well. And what is the process of that? You sort of go through like the basics of like p- p- piecing together a track. Or? Yeah, everyone did something different. Right. Um, so like um, and my series that I was doing of so there was those three of us I can't remember who the other two are but um, someone did like a live show run run down um, like how they perform live mm-hmm. electronic music Dismantle sorry was the other one and he did his drum programming mm-hmm. he bought like a full iMac um, like he didn't do it from a laptop he bought like the full actual computer <laughs> and like set himself up on the on the stage of that but um, I just did so he did yeah he did that and then I did like just basically making a track from, track from scratch mm. so I used to love the fact against the clock videos mm. I don't yeah, know if you've yeah, seen yeah, those yeah. Yeah. but they just don't they don't really do them anymore um, and also they're like loads of producers will like really pre-prepare stuff and they'll be like here's the loop I made earlier cool I'll put that in now and now I'll just film myself automating it or something yeah, for the rest yeah. of the time whereas it used to be like people literally just scrambling around really taking a risk on it mm-hmm. and like sometimes the results will be terrible mm-hmm. um, but there, there was quite a charm in that because yeah, it, just, it shows it, yeah. a human like like aspects of making music 100%. like it's not always going to be easy so that's what I wanted to do I just like just literally just kind of chucked some bits about on the spot and then just kind of talk through a process of how I was doing it it's a shame that those like fact videos and like I know like um, and I think I saw one that Boiler Room used to do or maybe they still do it where like they take like samples from like the audience and, and that sort of thing oh, I can't okay. remember the bloody name of it now but I was watching it with Longies the other day um, but it's a shame that there's less of those now like I'd really like to like like either see a resurgence of them or like I mean I've got like a billion ideas but I'd love to do something like that similar mm. to sort of like like to sort of bring that back because like it can be so helpful to people just watching that to see like what is actually possible with like the software like your I guess your your teaching background must have helped a lot yeah for you yeah, and, like, yeah actually I think so through that yeah how long was it how long did you have to like in the, in the workshop to, like go, to go over I think it was about an hour and a half so oh, I did like a quick talk about like my musical journey at the start yeah. and then yeah just basically spent like an hour just kind of making a track and then just did a Q&A mm. at the end but it's pretty good but yeah you are right there I don't know why there's less of these things I, th- I would have thought this is like the golden age where there's kind of like more producers than ever it make it would make perfect sense to have uh-huh. to have more of more of those things going. Are you I, getting ideas? You're starting to devise something. I I've had <laughs> ideas for a while. I really want to bring back like you know you have like rhythm roulette for like the old hip hop yeah, 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 like, yeah, you yeah, go yeah. to a record shop and yeah. you find whatever and you sample it. Like I, I really want to do more stuff like that. And I think probably the a large part of the reason why it doesn't happen anymore is because so much music media is just so like bitterly like underfunded. Like mm. there's no money, any of that sort of thing. And I think like it, it's getting to a point now where like I mean I'm just writing myself now where like the, the, I, I was reading an article the other day about like this like new kind of music like independent music media that's like coming through to where it was these like sort of corporate giants and now it's like sort of little guys that are producing their own stuff whether or not that's like good for the scene or, or not is inter- is you know sort of up for debate I suppose but I think the interesting thing is is that like you said there are so many more producers but there's so many less platforms that are um like like positioning things in like an interesting and like easy digestible way. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it seems like it's all just like mixed series. Oh, it's a very unstable table. Don't worry, oh, yeah, it's fine. God, sorry, no, 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 mate, pull it away. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, there's just like there's so many more producers, but there's there's so many less platforms doing things in an interesting way, and like it seems like it it, it kind of we're in a position now where it's just like mixed series and and, and releases. Do you know what mm. I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I, how important do you think that sort of third party is to like the health of a scene? Bloody hell, God! You keep hitting me with I'm sorry, mate. questions. Listen, mate, I'm a journalist by by trade, so um, um, I'm gonna yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I think like, what is what is my kind of view on it? Like, because like people engage with it when it's there, right? And people love it, and obviously it did really well. But when it's gone, like, do you, like do you feel like there's like a noticeable like shift in people's like in like the scenes maybe attitude to, like towards that? Because I feel like it. 
it must add to like mm. it adds to like the sort of community fear of things right you know it adds to the sort of like we're all having a laugh like it's all a bit of fun and I think maybe it can get to the point now where it just seems like everyone's just got their heads down and like they're just making tunes and there's, there's no the, I mean the scene is still incredibly healthy but I would love to bring back that kind of sort of like real underground sort of like passion of just like making like making cool interesting like silly things and I feel like there's there's definitely less of that now than there was um, is it yeah I'm, I suppose my brain has kind of gone on to like why that's maybe happened yeah. and maybe it's because of the way we digest things at the moment mm -hmm. like though I think maybe the format that it works in just isn't digest like it is not just the way we digest things anymore we digest things like through social media mm. and I think like the con confines of what you can actually do as a piece of kind of media I suppose on social media is completely different Maybe that's maybe that's the reason. Like I suppose like interviews now, like uh, like I did an interview with Breaking Breaks the other day, oh, and yeah. their, their interview format is shout out to Breaking Breaks, of course. Yeah, but their interview format is just is is over ten slides or seven slides, I can't remember, and it will just be kind of a question and a response on kind of each slide, mm -hmm. which I think works well. Um, but like it's and it's definitely like a form of interviewing that didn't like really exist before, mm. but like, yeah, that long form, I remember like, you know, getting mix mag back in the day and you'd read like a full two page kind of really, really deep, deep chat with someone. Um, so yeah, I think like it's definitely, maybe that's the reason why it's changed, but yeah, there should be, I don't know. Yeah. Why, why is, why is against the clock it's gone? Diff why did they ever exactly. stop that? And like, I could like sort of to combat your point, say that like, you know, like things like podcasts now, are like bigger than they've ever been. Mm. People are willing to sit down and engage with a piece of, of long form content if you give them like an incentive, if you produce something that's like worth it. Like for me, like you talk about the, the subject of like reading like a two page, like feature in mixed bag or whatever. Like the writing side of things is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. It's something that I want to follow a lot more, but I also get the vibe that people just don't read anymore, do they? Mm. You know, like, pe like people's consumer habits have changed. It's one of the reasons why I decided to do this podcast because it felt like bridging the gap in between this long form written stuff and like the sort of social media easy to digest mm. you know you can put it into clips and all this sort of thing I don't know do you think it's worth me trying to write some shit write some like as in write the interviews down no like write like features and like pieces on things do you think people would engage with that I'm just asking you for advice now on my own fucking podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I don't, like, do, like I guess well, dude, be, I can't remember the last interview I read. Exactly, that's what I, I was can't remember say, the last yeah. interview I read. So maybe, maybe no, mm -hmm. maybe don't do it. I think apart from your own breaking breaks interview, of apart course. from my own breaking breaks, yeah, but <laughs> but maybe I wouldn't. But that was almost more like it didn't feel like a, a written interview that you'd maybe get in a print because sure. it was it was almost like multimedia. Like they source loads of photos of me as well. Mm -hmm. It had like I put like unreleased tracks behind it, so it was a bit more of kind of like a three D experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah, like I can't remember. The, I suppose I've seen like video like videos like YouTube sort of videos which are maybe like nine minutes long or something like that, where they're like maybe a day with an artist or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen those. So maybe maybe like more video, but it's like. It around maybe is like video is the way it's going isn't it I guess yeah, yeah. this is the thing and like, I don't mind it but it's like a hell of a lot more effort than like writing something now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah um, circling back a little bit to your like performances and you playing out yeah you played you had a pretty busy festival season last year if I do remember rightly not that I saw busy. you play quite a few. I no. saw I saw you at El Dorado. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that, was, yep. that was awesome. You were standing on the table. I remember that. that oh yeah, that was the table. Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> that was uh, that almost went so badly because I got up and the table just started wobbling and it had all the decks on. I was there was obviously like you know a thousand or so people there as well and I was like if I fall here this is the end of my life. Like I will never <laughs> I will never financially recover from this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like yeah, that was that was wild. That was so much fun. And then what else? I, I did nowadays festival as well. Of did, course, uh, you headline nowadays, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh my Ooh, god! Whoa! <laughs> whoa! What happened there? That's that's making the edit. I'm yeah, oh, I think I just knocked the handle just when I was playing around. You're gonna have to stand. Can we go stand back up here? There you for, go. Yep. Yep. There we go. There cool. We go. We'll go back there for um, <laughs> what's the continuity. So uh, nice. we're yeah, not, yeah. you know, if anyone's, if you make an edit, I'm not. This is an incredibly in professional height. show. So yeah. that's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost pulled the table down a minute ago as well. So you're fucking tearing down whammy. the chat and breach. I'm studio. just, I'm quite chaotic. Is that yeah. why you're here? Is to tear down, tear down yeah, the pole? Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, I'm from Mixmag and I've come as like a a, a, a psyop. To, I knew uh, this day would come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were stood on the table last night as well, right? I saw a clip of you. Yeah, I did. I, I think that might be my new thing. Yeah. Um, it's just like. 
like, yeah, XLI. I think this is the first time I've been there in a while where it was just two CDJs in the middle with the mixer. And it was just a bit of a space to the side. And I was like, oh, that's not been here yet at the residency. And I was like, I'm going to stand oh, on I'm that. I'm going to stand on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we were like talking about uh, girls don't sink me and Adam and about how much energy they have when they play shouts, mm. shouts out to girls mm. don't sink as well. And like one of, um, one of the things they do is like, just, just get up on stuff all the time. And I was like, I'm, and, and may, I must've just channeled that, you know, it's like one or <laughs> two in the morning. And I was like, I'm going to get on the table. Here we go. Um, so yeah, girls did, don't sink. If you're looking for a new member. Yeah. If you, if you want someone who can <laughs> avidly stand on the table and not hurt themselves, I'm, uh, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. The table standing things come, uh, come out quite big recently. I think I saw Skrillex was doing it quite a lot. Yeah. He, he loves a table, table stand, stand, doesn't he? <laughs> who, who doesn't love a table stand? Ben UFO. I'd be shocked if he yeah, did a he table definitely, stand. There's no way he's standing on a table. Yeah. I think cool. Super seems like he would do a table stand, but I don't think object would. That's a controversial statement. Yeah. What do you think defines? <laughs> here we go. What do you what, what do you think defines a DJ who's capable of a table stand? Well, they've got to be nimble. I think yeah, to get uh -huh. up on the table. Would you say you're a nimble fellow? No. Well, no. Well, no, 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 no. You're, you're <laughs> there's no the redeeming. There's no redeeming thing now. I'm <laughs> one of the least. I mean, I'm six four, so like mm -hmm. any amount of nimbleness I have is just lost. That's by, why by I trapped the chair for it instead. to fall down so yes. that you would look shorter yeah, than me. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, probably nimbleness, um, uh, an appreciation of a good table, maybe, so that they can yeah. they can sort it out. Yeah, I think nice. um, I think you have to play a good enough tune to warrant a table stand as yeah, well. Yeah, you're not just standing on the table for like like no reason, like no. like you know mid blend or whatever. Yeah, or, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, or like in a really long drum track or something like that. Yeah, There's probably uh -huh. no need for it. Yeah, I suppose you're playing music. Oh God, but yeah, you're playing music probably with big euphoric moments and or drops yeah there has to be i would probably say quite a large crowd in attendance yeah yeah you don't want to be doing it's two people yeah, yeah, yeah. warming up yeah 10, 10 o'clock clubs just open on the table <laughs> um back to the festivals yeah you did El, El Dorado. you did nowadays yeah did you do glasto no i did glasto the year before right how yeah. was that glasto was mad yeah. yeah really really cool um it was a six stage which wasn't there last year annoyingly um called totem mm -hmm. but it's like all female team running it which is really really cool they um yeah i met them and they looked like they were having quite a wild time nice. and i went to play so i wondered why maybe that's why they weren't back the next year because <laughs> okay. uh, something went wrong but um but yeah they were they were super lovely they um the stage was wicked it was like it was four stacks as well around the dance floor so wow. um yeah it was proper cool but um yeah what just went as a punter last mm -hmm. year to glastonbury mm -hmm. i think i've had all festivals ruined by Glastonbury now and I think like really? I can never not go to Glastonbury and I think any other festival I go to I'm like well this one isn't Glastonbury uh, have you ever been? No I've not oh, I've never dude. been you will ruin yourself like that is it's kind of like you'll always be kind of like what this could be Glastonbury what's so good about else. it is it just the sheer size of it or I think it I think I think the size means you can have so much more different stuff going on. Yeah. And I think you feel like you've maybe got, you can have like a really uh, individual experience there because no one else will do the exact same thing as you. Mm -hmm. Even like on a day, no one else will do the exact same thing as you, let alone like over the whole weekend. What so do you, you mean? No one else will do the exact same thing? Is it like of... you, like, like the variety in acts that you, that you see? And I right. think because like this, because it's so big, the gap between stages is quite big. So you end up like having mini adventures going mm. between stuff. And like, you can like easily go for like two days without seeing your best mate who you're camped with just because of the size as well. Uh -huh. So I don't know, it, it feels like a, a bit more an adventure maybe. Mm -hmm. I think that sounded cringy. No, I, 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 I've never <laughs> been, I really want to go. It's just fucking expensive. Yeah, so funny. <laughs> and it's just so hard to get tickets. Except for this year, mm. it seems like everyone I know got a ticket this year. Really? Whereas last year, hardly anyone I knew got really? a ticket. Really, that's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, they're all sold out now, I presume. They're all sold out. Are you going yeah, this yeah. year? Going or? this year as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Nav, who got my ticket. Big up, we, Nav. I've, I've logged on to get a ticket every single year and failed, but this man gets through it every single year. Um, What's his secret? I don't know. I think I think it's impossible to get them in London. Um, I really? Think I think because I met someone who goes on a family holiday every year. All their, all their family go to Glastonbury and they time their holiday because they know their chances of getting tickets will be better if they're abroad. So they'll like go to like Spain because less, I think less people are buying them in Spain and something about the queue system means right. they come through. So like you hear about people in Scotland getting them loads. Loads of people in Liverpool get them as well. Really? So I don't know if they like purposely vary it like specifically, but apparently it's really easy to get them in Liverpool. That's, I had no idea that was even, that was even possible for them to do. That's yeah. crazy. 
you brought your parents to El Dorado with you. Oh yeah, my parents came along. That was the first <laughs> yes. time they'd ever seen me DJ. Really? So, yeah, first time ever. That must have been like such, like they must have been so proud. Yeah, it was nice. It was really, it was proper wow. sweet. It was proper family, family day out. Yeah, <laughs> they're having a nice time. They had so many punters coming up to them, just being like, "Oh, how you, how come you're here? Oh, yeah." They were the oldest person at the festival by a long way. Yeah, <laughs> bless them. It's a funny crowd at El Dorado. I, I yeah, didn't yeah, yeah, expect it, it to be. I didn't really know what to expect, but it was a funny crowd. I thought it was interesting because at the start of your set, I'm not sure. I think there was a, a, a gap before you started, so it was it was pretty quiet around the front. And being there, and I saw your parents sort of down the way, and then like turn around after like twenty minutes, and it was just like fucking like all the way back. It was so busy, and it was you and O'Flynn as well, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And you, you've done quite a lot of stuff together with him, with him now, haven't you? Yeah, we over over lockdown, we like we decided to start making music together. Um, funnily enough, it was a speed garage track that I played in a mix, mm. and that he like wanted an idea of and then we just got talking about it loads and loads and then we were like why don't we just make a speed carriage track he had never like made anything of that sort of genre before but yeah we just sat we'd like you know tracks became more tracks and then became enough for like an ep and then i remember like i still remember like the evening where we just done like another really really good session and ben was like i think we should do this as an album um i think uh yeah, yeah and that was really cool and then it got released on ninja tune as well which is a really cool experience um yeah it was great the album it was really cool mm, how did you meet him through so he was in a record shop one day uh sounds of the universe and they're playing my first ever ep the sandboy killer one with like oh baby on and i can't remember what the other tracks were on there mm -hmm. um released on warehouse rave um course, shout out yeah. to d as well i'm giving a lot of shout outs yes. but, um, yeah he heard that and then bought it and then one of my mates who I lived with in Leeds just tagged me in a photo or like, or put the captioners like, or hanging out with Soundboy Killer or something. And then Ben just messaged um, our mate Francis and was just like, wait, is that a producer called Soundboy Killer? So I was moving down to London and then, yeah, when I moved down, we just met up like in the first few weeks, just had, had some nice pints and then, yeah, just started hanging out. Nice. And when, when, did, when did you move to London? Did you move fr straight from Leeds? Straight or? from Leeds, yeah. yeah. Ah. What, what do you make of London? Yeah, I love London. Yes. I absolutely love London. It's I think the only problem with it is just expensive rents. But like, yeah. other than that, I love the place. Well, even in Bristol now, it's fucking crazy expensive. Mm, like, yeah, it's, it's I'm, I'm hearing close. about it in Bristol. It's ridiculous. Like, I'd like, I don't know what the average price is in London, but Bristol's getting there. And like, the wages aren't increasing here, so it's mm. fucking lethal. Um, it's interesting. We've had quite a lot of chats about London on here and everyone, it's very polarizing. People either absolutely love it or they just think it's just not for me, like at all. Mm. Um, do you think it's helped with your sort of, like, like your your journey through like the, like the dance music industry in terms of like people meeting people and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think like I was definitely made in Leeds. Like I used to love, I, the thing I miss about Leeds was I used to hang out with like all the stretchy dance supply guys mm. um, and like through them met quite a lot of people as well. But it was really nice because that was kind of it. That was like the, the, the only kind of crew that we had in Leeds. So that was really nice just like, like Solmas as well, Solmas Transit of System course. in Leeds. I've known him like, dude, I've known him for like over 10 years. Like he, I met him on they, first, first day of uni. Are they still in Leeds? Um, sorry, they, are they even? Um, yeah, yeah, he, uh, they, uh, I can't remember where they're living at the moment. Um, Leeds or Hebden Bridge uh -huh. sort of way, uh -huh. I think, yeah. But um, but yeah, I, 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 that was really nice. That like got me to grow. But then moving to London, you are just like, you are around so many different people. And it just means that like you can, just very quickly meet up with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And like, if you're like playing the same night as someone, it's really easy to just like hang out, like kind of around the gig and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, Do you think you'll be there for the foreseeable then? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, yeah, I can't see myself leaving anytime soon. Mm -hmm. What about you in Bristol? Oh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Cause like, I, I, I love Bristol when it has such like a, like a really like, such a healthy like underground mm. and such a great like grassroots culture but it's tough because like, I want to explore different scenes and I want to sort of meet new people and especially like if I'm trying to go down this more sort of like storytelling I guess like I don't want to call it journalistic route but you know that, this sort of thing it would be great to be somewhere where like everybody is yeah um but I'm fucking terrified of moving to London so yeah. I don't think it's happening anytime <laughs> soon what's, what's putting you off about it mm, I guess it is just like I mean, really, I, if I'm being completely honest, it's like, I feel like if I was to move there now, like, I, I'm not saying that, like, I'm, I'm I'm certainly not a big fish in Bristol, but, like, I think if I was to move to somewhere like London, I'd be, like, 
in an even tinier fish mm. in an even bigger pond. Well, you're known. You know, all it takes is a quick drop of the uh, the M bomb uh, mentioning your name, Mars, and uh, <laughs> you said like, the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you said the, the M bomb. Yeah, the M bomb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I need like, to make that very clear. <laughs> the M bomb. <laughs> M for Michael. Oh, what's the yeah? What's the phonetic <laughs> alphabet? M for. I think it is. Michael, right? Okay, after. yeah. Well, anyway. let's go with that. Yeah. So, yeah, a quick drop of the M bomb, mm. and um, and you seem to be known by a lot of people. Of really? Bristol. Yeah, yeah. They've mm. always got good things to say about you as well. Heaven knows why. Yeah. But brilliant. <laughs> You're clearly paying them off enough money. At the oh, moment, obviously, then. yeah, yeah. But I didn't know they were actually taking that seriously. But um, I'm conscious for time because yeah, I know you cool. have to be at nudes in 28 minutes. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's time to wrap. Them. Well, let's let's wrap this baby up. Um, Fraser Ray, thank you so much for coming on. Mate, thank you so much. Thanks this for is having great. me. No, no, not at all. Um, I'll have you back very soon, I'm sure. Yeah, sweet. Sounds uh, good. Anything else you wanted to say to the people of Chatting Breeze before we... Oh, um... Bit, bit, bit yeah, of, what bit you of can do, there. Why don't you cut this silence out and nah, then I'll no, actually mate, say... Um, Ofcom off off are going to find us for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's a good bit of advice Ooh, that I've had yeah. recently? I'll think of something like that. Um... I actually can't think of anything. You've, had, you've never had any good advice. I've never had a single good bit of advice. Well, that's a good bit of advice, is to never listen to advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, flipping heck. I can't think. Oh, oh no, that's a terrible bit of advice. Perfect. Say, all right, okay, this is so lame. Main phase told me this last night, which is, if you want to see it, no, this is so lame and so niche. I'm not doing this. I'm <laughs> no, not doing please, this. you have to. Like, what you can't would be do better? This. What would be better to say? Uh, never suggest that doors sound different. Yes. <laughs> when you're doing a talk, never suggest. I'll tell you what, no, fancy, I'm not even wearing fancy trousers. I they're, would say, yeah, reasonably fancy. This, is, this is my advice mm. I'll give then. You can cut all that lovely dead air uh, and get to this <laughs> bit. Is if you're going to spend money on yeah. a nice item of clothing, mm. spend it on your trousers because if you spend it on your shoes, your shoes will get scuffed. Mm. If you spend it on a jumper, mm. you might put the jumper down and lose it or you might spill something on it. Mm. If it's on a coat, you'll probably put that down and lose it as well. If it's on a t-shirt, you have to you have to you should wash those after one wear most of the time. Mm. Whereas if you do it <laughs> on yeah, mm. but if you do it on your trousers, uh. you don't have to wash your trousers. You know, that's a few wears you get. Ever. You you never you rarely take them off in public. It, rarely. Rarely. Um, <laughs> and therefore I think it's just like it makes more sense to spend your money on your trousers. So that's my bit of advice I'll leave. Fraser Ray, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, mate. Big up. See ya. Nice one, man. Well, that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Um, like I said, such a good episode. Super gassed that Fraser was able to come on a podcast uh, while he was on a whistle-stop tour of Bristol. Unfortunately, uh, we only managed to get an hour of conversation in, um, whereas usually we go for the hour and a half for the Patreon crew. Uh, but my guy had to rush off to go play radio, so... But we still had an excellent hour of conversation, I'm sure you'll agree. But the fun does not stop there, because if you would like more Chatting Breeze content, then head over to patreon.com slash belters and subscribe to join the Belters Club for £5 a month. You will get all of our episodes a week early. There's already a bonus one up there right now from next week, and that's an absolute banger. And they're an extra half an hour long, so you can sneer at all your puny friends that listen to the hour-long episode, because how bloody embarrassing. Also, you get all the Belters dubs. There's some tunes on there right now that you ain't going to want to miss that aren't coming out for at least another month. So strap in when you join the Belters Club, ladies and gentlemen. There's a whole heap of goodies on there. Um, that's me for now. Thank you for watching, listening, whatever, as always. And I'll catch you next week. Safe.